Welcome everybody on behalf of CARP and the NIS. And so we are very excited to launch this CARP NIS COVID-19 data science webinar. And so this webinar is co-sponsored by seven uh, statistical society and organization, including the committee of president of statistical societies, and uh, also is five um, charter uh, society members, including the ASA, and INAR and WINAR and the MS and also the SSCs and also NIS. In particular, I want to thank um, uh, NIS and, uh, and especially uh, and Jim, uh, Dr. Jim uh, Rosenberg, the director of the NIS, and who helped with the logistics of this uh, uh, webinar. And so the goal of this webinar is to promote the data-driven research and decision-making to fight against the COVID-19. And so we plan to have this webinar offered bi-weekly at noon time Eastern time on Thursdays. And the, uh, the future webinars uh, information can be obtained at this uh, website. So um, I would like to thank uh, the 17, 14, uh, 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 15 members of the organizing committee, they consist of members of the seven organizing societies. And in particular, I would like to thank uh, Natalie Dean, who is assistant professor of biostatistics at the University of Florida. And she is the uh, chair and also the moderator of the, our first webinar on statistics of uh, vaccine trials. So Natalie uh, has been um, very active and uh, during the last few months on COVID-19 research. And so she has expertise uh, from the epidemic modeling to vaccine trial designs. And so she has also been active in serving as on the advisory board of several organizations, including the COVID tracking project and WHO's vaccine trial protocols. And also she has been instrumental and uh, in uh, helping with the scientific communications and by sharing the scientific funding with the general public. So for example, she has the uh, Twitter followers of over 90,000 uh, people. So it's my great pleasure to introduce the chair and the moderator of Natalie. And Natalie, you can take on. Hi. Thank you so much, Shi Hong. So welcome everyone. I'm Natalie Dean. I'm an assistant professor in biostatistics. I specialize in emerging infectious diseases and vaccine evaluation. And I'm on the organizing committee for this new webinar series. And I was really honored to be asked to put together our first webinar on a very timely topic, which is COVID-19 vaccines. So thanks to everyone uh, for joining us today. It's really an impressive turnout and exceeded our expectations. Um, and so vaccine evaluation, including randomized trial designs, observational studies, and the analysis of correlates of protection, these are all very interesting area of statistics. And there's a lot of room for innovation and really clever quantitative thinking. But I imagine that the turnout is also driven by the nature of this topic and how directly impactful it is on our lives as we really make sense of the news right now and make decisions to protect ourselves in our communities. So, um, I'm really grateful for the chance to invite these wonderful experts here to talk about COVID-19 vaccine statistics. First, we have Dr. David Benkeser. He is an assistant professor of biostatistics and bioinformatics at Emory University Rollins School of Public Health. He completed his PhD in biostats at the University of Washington and a postdoc fellowship at UC Berkeley. He is broadly interested in methods involving the integration of machine learning and causal inference and specifically how these methods can be applied to vaccines and prevention science. Um, his words, when COVID vaccine work is not consuming all of his waking hours, uh, I think he's very busy right now. He also works on HIV, malaria, and influenza vaccine research, as well as research on HIV prevention in adolescents through the Adolescent Medicine Trials Network. Um, on a personal note, David has been one of the first people I reach out to to really compare notes on the news when new vaccine trial results emerge. And I've been so grateful for his insights. So today he's going to give a presentation um, at warp speed uh, on statistics and COVID-19 vaccine development. Um, our other expert is uh, Professor Elizabeth Halloran. She is director of the Biostatistics, Bioinformatics and Epidemiology Program in the Vaccine and Infectious Disease, Diseases Division of the Fred Hutch Cancer Research Center. 
and professor of biostatistics at the University of Washington. She's founder and director of the Summer Institute for Statistics and Modeling of Infectious Diseases, the CISMID program, uh, which has been running at the University of Washington since 2009. It's an excellent program I've attended twice. Um, uh, Professor Halloran is a member of the National Academy of Medicine, retiring chair of the section on statistics at AAAS, a fellow of the ASA, AAAS, Royal Statistical Society. She's been doing research on evaluating the complex effects of vaccination uh, in populations, including causal inference methods since the late 1980s. She's worked on uh, malaria vaccines, varicella, influenza, HIV, TB, rotavirus, pertussis, cholera, typhoid, dengue, Ebola, Zika, and now COVID-19. Um, she's literally written the book on many of the methods we use today to evaluate vaccines. And on a personal note, she's been a really wonderful mentor to me and now collaborator, and I've benefited so immensely from her incredible scientific insights. So uh, without further ado, the structure of the section, um, David will give his talk. Uh, after that, Bets will offer some remarks. We'll have a moderated Q&A portion and then an audience Q&A portion. We'll wrap up uh, on time by 1 p.m. Eastern, 10 a.m. Pacific. You can use the Q&A function to submit questions. Um, I think you can also like questions that have been submitted by others um, uh, so we can see which ones are, um, are uh, of most interest to folks. And the chat is open for discussion. So, um, so thanks so much. So, so with that, uh, David, we'll take it away. Okay, so I'm sharing my screen. Hopefully that's visible to everybody. I'll count on Natalie yelling at me if not. So thanks everybody so much for joining today and thanks to the organizers of what looks to be a, a fantastic seminar series, very timely. Uh, and thanks to Natalie and of course, Bets for joining today in this, in this discussion. So I'll kick it off with you know, my talk with a very fancy name at Warp Speed, talking a little bit about sort of where we're at in COVID-19 vaccine development and sort of how we got here and highlighting kind of the role that statistics has played uh, along the way. Um, and so I'll just mention that these slides are available online uh, via this link before. So if you want to follow along on your own computer, you can please feel free to do so. And there's various hyperlinks to references um, and press releases and so forth throughout the talk. Okay, so we all read the news and we sort of all know where we're at. And I, I think in terms of, of, of all the news that's been generating very quickly, you know, the first thing I did when I woke up this morning was make sure there wasn't some, some brand new news release that would change the entire tone of this talk. But thankfully I, I didn't see anything in the headlines yet today. Maybe something new will come in uh, during the talk, but, but results are coming fast and furious these days. Uh, and for the most part, they've been really great. You know, because so we have now Pfizer and BioNTech uh, as well as Moderna reporting very highly efficacious vaccines, AstraZeneca also reporting an efficacious vaccine, though perhaps with a few caveats that maybe we can we can get into if there's time. Uh, we've just heard yesterday the UK has approved Pfizer's vaccine for use, and of course the FDA will be hearing uh, uh, results of the Pfizer vaccine next week at this time, uh, and then Moderna's vaccine a week after that. And so that's sort of where we're at. And I want to kind of talk about how we managed to get here and, and what a scientific achievement it was and the role that statistics and particular statisticians have played uh, along the way. So a lot of the development in the US of, of vaccines that's really enabled this, this really rapid uh, testing and, and hopefully approval of these vaccines has been through this government program you may have heard of uh, called Operation Warp Speed. Um, and what this has really uh, enabled us to do is, is um, to shift a lot of the risk away from companies in terms of vaccine manufacturing uh, and evaluation and have the government inherit that risk. And I think this is one of the things that, that the U.S. government has really gotten right uh, in terms of a pandemic response. And so the two ways that they've sort of been able to facilitate this rapid development uh, for, from the government's perspective is first that the government has been funding, of course, these large phase three trials to evaluate the efficacies of these vaccines. So these companies who are manufacturing these vaccines enter into an agreement uh, with an arm of, of the NIH with, with BARDA. And it basically stipulates that, that the NIH will have some oversight of their trial and in accordance will pay for it. Uh, and that really removes some of the burden from these companies and, and bringing what is in, in some ways an underdeveloped vaccine into a very large uh, evaluation trial. The second way that, that risk is shifted from these companies to the government in this process is through manufacturing agreements. And what that does is basically allow these manufacturers uh, to start scaling up their manufacturing pretty much immediately. 
right, without knowing yet whether these vaccines will be effective. So, so you know, the, the company's been working on overdrive to manufacture these vaccines so that if and when the vaccines are shown to be effective, right, we'll be ready to start distributing them. Uh, and this is really, you know, I think ultimately going to be a huge success story, uh, given the results that we've seen so far and really being able to bring uh, several effective vaccines uh, to millions of, of people in, in, in a time scale that's, that's heretofore sort of unheard of. And so what small role have I played in all of this um, and, and, uh, and other statisticians as well has been through the establishment of this COVID-19 prevention network. And so the COVID-PN was formed by NIAD. It was uh, basically bringing together four existing trials networks, clinical trials networks, uh, and leveraging exist existing frameworks that we have for evaluating vaccines, whether that's through clinical sites where we recruit participants um, and collect data on those participants, whether it's through laboratories where we're you know, running assays of immune responses and so forth, uh, whether it's through our recruitment specialists that are you know, going into the communities to try to gain trust, to increase enrollment, particularly in diverse populations in these trials, and as well as through a group of statisticians. And this is a, a group of statisticians that I worked with for many years, many of them are out there in Seattle with vets at the Fred Hutch uh, and, and work a lot on HIV vaccines. And so that's sort of the pathway that I had um, to lead me into this work. And so the role that we've been playing as statisticians in the context of this COVPN uh, and the broader umbrella sort of OWS uh, Operation Warp Speed uh, effort has been several things. So, so this is really an agreement between the government um, and we're sort of representatives of the government in, in a way here uh, in these companies. And so it's a really a collaborative effort between uh, our statisticians, our lab scientists and the companies to basically figure out how the companies can accomplish their goal, which is to bring a safe and effective vaccine to market, have it approved by the FDA, uh, as well as the goals, the broader goals of OWS and, and really science to understand how these vaccines work um, and to really make sure that we're in a good position uh, to, to have good data generated to understand that these vaccines work and can be distributed. Uh, in a timely fashion. And so some of the ways that we've integrated with these company statisticians uh, is providing some advisement on, on the, the design of the trial and the analytic methods that, that they might use, sequential efficacy monitoring, uh, when should we be taking interim looks at data, how often should we be doing that, the statistical methods needed to sort of appropriately uh, control type one error rates if we do, safety monitoring concerns, right? That's always a big feature of vaccine trials. How are we gonna monitor for safety? Uh, when are we going to declare that a signal that we're seeing is really of great concern and how will that be communicated to the trials DSMB? Uh, we play a role, of course, in all of the interfacing between the companies and the DSMBs of these trials uh, and the FDA, right, who's the other key player in this. And so the, the, all along the way, the DSMB and the FDA are reviewing these trial protocols, the statistical analysis plans, providing their feedback, and we're sort of serving the advisory role for the companies, uh, basically to be able to bounce ideas off of to, to arrive at the best design. And then one area in particular where, you know, it's important, I think the work that the COVPN is doing is in immune correlates and trial harmonization. And so, you know, the, the facet of the OWS is, is that we're really currently running, you know, multiple large phase three trials. Um, and there's a risk, right, if we're not talking to one another across these trials of generating data that will be very hard to compare in the end. Right? We need some level of harmonization to make sure that we're going to be able to effectively compare results across these trials. And in no place is that more uh, true than in this immune correlates area. And so that's an area I'll focus on at the end of this talk and an area we've really been sort of taking the lead on. And I think statisticians in particular have been sort of leading the science. So I think it's, it's pretty neat. Uh, but before we get there, I want to just talk about these trials in general, right? How are we generating data from these trials? What data are being generated? And how do we approach the analysis of this data? So this is all very sort of high level stuff. You know, I had like one mathematical equation in this talk and Betts made me take it out. So this is again, just all very high level thinking, but it's exactly the kind of thinking that I think statisticians can help with, right? What are we here for? It's really to take scientific questions and, and translate them into statistical estimates and provide ways that we can efficiently estimate them from the data. And so I want to just talk about some of the high level issues that have come up when we've been thinking about the design of these trials and analysis of the data generated from them. And so to do that, I'll motivate it from the AstraZeneca trial design. So this is the phase three U.S. trial, not the one that's been reported by AstraZeneca in the U.K. and Brazil, uh, the U.S. phase three trial. Um, and I'll motivate just sort of the data that are being generated in these trials. They're all largely similar in design. There's little details that differ between uh, them, but I'll use AZ's trial as just sort of a blueprint for the data that we can expect to be generated from these trials. 
uh, and then talk about you know, what we can expect to do with those data. And then I'll note that you know, somewhat unusually, right, there was a big public effort this summer uh, right, through individuals like Eric Topol uh, and others to, to really push the companies to make the protocols of these trials public. And, and the companies were gracious enough to do that. Uh, which is great. And so there's hyperlinks here actually in the slides to the, the companies. If you really want to wade through, you know, 150 page protocols and all the amendments that have come since then, you know, you're welcome to do that. And I think that level of transparency uh, that the companies are willing to show is, is, is a very good thing. Uh, and so in those protocols, in the AZ protocol, you'll see a table that or a figure that looks like this. And I just want to use this figure to kind of walk through uh, the basics of the design of these trials and the types of data that are being generated. So first is who is enrolling in these trials. For the most part, these are adult populations. Since, since I made this talk, some of the companies have sort of lowered the bar for entry into the age group. I think Pfizer going down as low as 12 years old. And for the most part, these are healthier, medically stable individuals with chronic diseases. Uh, and what OWS is really focused on in particular is recruiting participants who are at high risk uh, for SARS-CoV-2 acquisition and for COVID-19 disease. And Right, that's important for a couple of reasons, right? It's important scientifically and from a public health perspective, right, to recruit the individuals who are most uh, or who are experiencing the most sort of morbidity and mortality associated with the pandemic. But also from a statistical perspective, right, our, our heartless statistician perspective is that, you know, the more cases that we're able to observe, the faster we're able to get to a trial result. Uh, and so OWS has really spent a lot of effort in recruiting individuals at high risk. And again, this, is, this has involved a lot of community engagement, trying to get community buy-in uh, for many diverse communities. Okay, so at, at enrollment, uh, you could have been previously infected. That's actually not um, an exclusion criteria from these trials, though those individuals are tending to be excluded from the primary analysis of these trials. So that's just another thing that I'll note that's sort of interesting. So that's the trial population. And once they're enrolled, what happens? Well, there's a random randomization that occurs. For AstraZeneca, that's happening in a two to one ratio. So two times more likely to get the active vaccine versus a saline control. And then we sort of start our data collection, right? And so this data collection is happening longitudinally. That's what's happening on this timeline here. And so for the most part, these are two dose vaccines. And so you come in on the first day of the trial, we can collect, collect baseline information on you. Uh, you receive a PCR test and a serology test to determine whether you've been infected in the past or whether you have an active infection. Uh, and then you're given the first dose of a vaccine. And after that dose is given, in the interim between doses, we're collecting, of course, data on safety, right? We want to understand adverse reactions to the vaccine, how many people are feeling sick, how sick are you feeling, you know, what's the, what's the reactogenicity of these vaccines that's being evaluated between these doses. And then you come in for your second dose. And after that, similar, we want safety data. We want to know what the, the reactogenicity profile is like. And then crucially, and we'll come back to this, two weeks after uh, receipt of the final dose of the vaccine, in this case, the second dose of the vaccine, uh, a blood draw is taken, okay? And that blood draw is stored. And we're going to come back to talk a lot about that blood draw and what we do with it. What we're going to do is measure immune responses, but we're going to measure them in a particular way. So just keep that in the back of your head as we're going forward, that we have a blood draw on all these trial participants that we'll eventually use to understand immune responses that occur in response to the vaccine. So that's crucially what happens two weeks after the, the second dose of the vaccine. And the other thing that happens at that point is the clock kind of starts for accruing endpoints. Okay, and we'll talk about what are those endpoints that we want to study uh, at, at that point. But what happens is there's basically two ways that we can accrue endpoints. There's through passive follow-up, which basically we say, go live your life, take all the precautions that you, know, you should be taking uh, subject to public health recommendations. But if you feel sick, right, come into the clinic, right? And we'll give you a PCR test uh, if you're experiencing symptoms right, then we'll adjudicate you as a, as a COVID-19 endpoint. So that's this sort of passive follow-up, right, where we're counting on individuals to report whether or not they're getting sick. There's also periods of active follow-up. So that's just like this day 57, day 90, and day 180 visits for AstraZeneca. And that's when individuals are coming in um, and having a blood draw again, and we're evaluating uh, or, or we're doing a serology test to basically understand Right. Have you been infected in this interim? And what that's going to allow us to do is really pick up those asymptomatic infections, right? The passive follow-up is never going to pick up individuals who don't experience symptoms because they don't potentially know that they've been infected, right? But at these scheduled visits, we'll be able to pick up uh, through serology these asymptomatic infections. And so that, th this follow-up will continue uh, until the point where a certain number of endpoints accrued, which will trigger either an interim or a primary analysis. And then beyond that, even going beyond the establishment of potential efficacy, 
uh, and safety and maybe an, even an EUA, right? Follow-up will continue on these individuals for up to two years for, for safety endpoints. Okay, so what is the statistical hypothesis test that we're going for here? Well, vaccine efficacy, which is, um, I think, hopefully most people have, have been reading about in, in the newspapers, but let's at least talk explicitly about how we quantify the effects of vaccines. And again, Betts literally wrote the book on this, so it's, it's great that she's here as well. Um, so we quantify vaccines in, in what I think is a, is a slightly strange way. Uh, but once you get familiar with the scale, it, it doesn't seem so strange. So VE is the percent reduction in relative risk comparing vaccine to placebo. So it's like one minus a risk ratio. So the sort of moniker that I always give just to give people a sort of flavor and intuition for this measure is that you know VE could range on a scale of zero to one or zero percent to 100 percent if you like. And so how do we get VE close to 100%, right? 100% is the goal. Well, how could we do that? We would essentially eliminate all risk in the vaccine arm, right? If this numerator was zero, then VE would be one or 100%, right? In general, how do we make VE large? Well, we make risk of, of, of um, an endpoint lower under the vaccine than it is on the placebo, right? So if you have a VE of one, that means it's a perfectly effective vaccine. A VE of zero means that vaccine is doing nothing. And if VE is below zero, that means that vaccine is actually harmful. And so here in this slide, I'm leaving very general what I mean by risk, right? Risk is in quotes intentionally here. So risk of what? And that's a big question actually in these COVID-19 trials. What are we interested in evaluating the efficacy of these vaccines with respect to? So we'll talk about that. And then beyond that, statistically risk can be quantified in a number of different ways, like different statistical estimates can be used to line up with this, this notion of risk, right? So maybe it's a hazard based formulation, maybe based on a Cox model. Or maybe it's something more like a Kaplan-Meier type thing based on cumulative incidence or an incidence rate. Right? So there's many different ways we can think about quantifying risk as statisticians. And so consequently, actually, many of the companies are taking very different analytic approaches uh, to evaluating VE in their trials. And at first, this was very sort of alarming to me as a statistician that maybe, you know, could we get very disparate results from these trials just based on the estimate and the particular estimate that the company chose them. And it turns out that in this setting, because the, the events of interest are actually quite rare, all of these estimates end up being largely similar and all of the operating characteristics of trials based on these estimates also look similar. So the trials will have the same power to detect effective vaccines, essentially, you know, modulo maybe one or 2% here or there. Okay, and so what does FDA ask for from these COVID vaccines in terms of their level of efficacy? So the FDA guidance document, it's linked here, was asking for a point estimate of VE of at least 50% and a lower bound uh, of a confidence interval of at least 30%, right? So our best guess at how well the vaccine works is that it has to cut your risk in half, right? And we need to be sure that that vaccine uh, efficacy is higher than 30%. And so coming back to quantifying, you know, what is the, what is, what do we talk about when we talk about risk? What is risk of what? What is the most relevant endpoint? And so we've sort of all heard by now, right, that, that for SARS-CoV-2 and COVID-19, there's actually a, a sort of a complicated uh, triage that can happen to individuals who are infected, right? So individuals who are infected can go on either to develop symptomatic disease or asymptomatic, remain asymptomatic, right? And amongst those who develop symptomatic disease, some will go on to develop severe disease. And so this sort of begs the question, what is the most relevant endpoint when we want to describe how well vaccines work? Is it SARS-CoV-2 infection? Why might we like just this infection endpoint? Any infection, regardless of whether or not it causes symptoms, right? Well, certainly from a public health epidemic control perspective, it's, it's relevant, right? And moreover, from a statistical perspective, we'll observe many infections. That's good, we'll have, we'll have good power to detect effective vaccines. But of course, the question is, is it a clinically relevant one? We'll be, be picking up essentially a lot of cases uh, that never go on to develop any symptoms. And there's actually some statistical tricks or, or sorry, some statistical difficulties uh, in measuring VE against infection. So it's measured very coarsely in time, right? It's only occurring at these few scheduled follow-up visits is where we're able to ascertain these asymptomatic cases. Uh, and beyond that, there's sort of this classical statistical um, sort of uh, testing problem where if you're delivering uh, many tests to individuals, right? Even if they have high sensitivity, high specificity, but the prevalence is low, you risk having many false positives. And the result of that in terms of estimation of VE is, is a biasing of VE towards the null. So it's actually statistically quite challenging to get a good grasp on what VE is against infection. Uh, so we can move on to say, okay, what about the COVID endpoint, right? And this is infection plus some symptoms, 
you know, mild to moderate symptoms. Certainly we're moving towards an endpoint that's more clinically relevant, one for which we'll observe a, a, a certain number of cases. Uh, but there's still a question here, and many people were asking this over the summer, is, uh, is this a, a truly a clinically relevant endpoint if most of the symptoms in the cases that we're catching are mild, right? So for those individuals, they might like, you know, a severe endpoint, right? Obviously the most clinically relevant, uh, and actually a priori where we expect our vaccines to work the best. So that's why we, we maybe would prefer a severe endpoint. The challenge with that, of course, is that we'll observe far fewer number of severe cases than we will of symptomatic cases. Right, so we'll have to either design larger trials or wait longer period of time to get a result. And then I'll just mention briefly, I want to save time for discussion here, that we've, we've also proposed in, in this paper potentially combining all of these endpoints into a so-called kind of burden of disease score. And so I'll leave this off in the name of time, but I'd encourage you to take a look at this paper uh, that's linked here um, that describes why we think this burden of disease is maybe a nice uh, way of combining all these endpoints into a single kind of summary score of how well these vaccines work. And so what does FDA say about what, what risk criteria should we care about? Well, initially in their guidance document, they stated we should care about either symptomatic COVID disease or SARS-CoV-2 infection. But basically all the companies have uh, settled on using COVID as their endpoint. And that's kind of come down from OWS leadership, actually, that that, that is sort of the the uniformly preferred endpoint as a primary endpoint in these trials. But FDA also wants to see data on severe endpoints, okay? And so uh, all of these companies are gonna be required to show data uh, on severe as well as, as symptomatic COVID. And so just quickly going through the results that have been reported so far, I think uh, many people have seen the numbers quoted in press releases, right? The, the, the one facet of, of the COVID vaccine work that's being done right now is sort of science by press release. We haven't seen any publications um, I'll give the, the, the companies a pass because they're working sort of very hard at this juncture to prepare their FDA submissions, but we should hope in the next few weeks to start seeing more detailed data. So I show this table just for a couple of reasons. We can see the quoted VE, uh, but I also sort of roughly computed what 95% confidence intervals would look like. And the reason I want to put those up there is because sort of some people see these results and they say, oh, there's only 170 cases, right? That's, that doesn't seem like much data. Right? And, and actually, in a vaccine world, that is an immense amount of data. And so if you look at, at how much information we actually have uh, about VE against COVID, right, we're, our confidence intervals are very tight. Right? The lower bound is basically at 90% or above. And that's, that's pretty incredible. It's an incredible amount of data that we've, that we've actually been able to generate. Uh, and then for severe COVID, the one thing that I, I want to point out here right, is that, that both companies that have reported in the U.S., Pfizer and Moderna, have pointed have, have reported very good results on, on severe COVID, right? 100% efficacy for Moderna and 90% efficacy essentially for Pfizer. Uh, but what I'd like to point out is that Moderna was a company that engaged with OWS uh, very early on and Pfizer was not. So, so OWS was running Moderna's trial and Pfizer was not. And yes, Pfizer made it across the finish line first, but Moderna was actually a little bit more careful in how they recruited participants and consequently were able to, to recruit a higher risk pool of participants which is actually, I think, gonna strengthen the regulatory submission in that they were able to observe 30 cases of, of severe COVID, right? And so you can see the confidence interval associated with that vaccine efficacy has a lower bound of about 87 versus Pfizer, uh, where there's still a great amount of uncertainty with respect to their severe. So it's still really good results, I would say for Pfizer, but, but sort of, a, a, I would say, a vindication of the OWS approach for recruiting high-risk participants. Um, and I'll, maybe I'll save the AstraZeneca results that are sort of asterisks and the Sputnik results uh, for the Q&A, and we can get into those if we want to talk about those. Um, so those, those results were a bit equivocal, um, right, and, and had some difficulty in interpretation uh, that, that we can get into in discussion if there's time. But I want to save some time to talk about vaccine correlates. So that's sort of where we are, right? We have two great results uh, from companies, um, some equivocal results from AstraZeneca, and we're waiting on results from a few more uh, very large-scale trials in the U.S., but I want to talk a little bit about the role that CoVBN and the statistician group that we have are playing and where we're going with these trials, right? What, what's the future of COVID vaccine developments? And a lot of that has to uh, hinge on the establishment of a correlate of risk or correlate of protection. So I want to spend a little time describing what correlates analysis is. And, and in some sense, you can think of correlates analysis kind of having two interrelated goals. The first is that we're interested in understanding how the vaccines work. Right? What are the immune mechanisms whereby these vaccines are working and why do we really care about that? 
Uh, well, biologically, it's interesting, yes, but also we would really like to be able to establish a valid surrogate endpoint for future vaccine trials. Right? So we'd like to be able to, right now, the way we get a vaccine is approved, right, is we enroll 30,000, 50,000 individuals, we follow them up for months, right, and we look for COVID endpoints. And, and wouldn't it be really nice if instead we were able to give a smaller number of, smart, smaller number of individuals uh, their doses of vaccine, and then two weeks later, measure their immune response and already know at that point whether or not the vaccine will be pr protected. And that's really the goal of correlates analysis is to accelerate the approval of future vaccines, whether that's for new vaccines, right, in, in the same class. So maybe there's a new mRNA vaccine that's developed. We have data from Pfizer and Moderna to tell us that we've established sort of valid surrogate endpoint. Maybe we can use that surrogate endpoint to approve this new vaccine. But it's also important for bridging applications, right? So remember I said that most of these trials have been focused on uh, older adult populations, right? So what do we do about kids, right? And this is a potential area where correlates are gonna be very important to understand if we have a valid correlate, can we use that to do a st smaller study to generate immune response data, to generate safety data in children and to eventually move that indication of the vaccine to that population. And so we structure the thinking about correlates of, of, of uh, risk and protection into kind of two levels. So there's correlates of risk, and this is sort of classical statistical associations. Okay, so what we're looking for here are correlations between immune responses amongst those who receive the vaccine with the outcome. So you can think of it almost like risk prediction. I'll show you a couple plots uh, in just a second that will hopefully sort of give you a, a flavor of what these types of analyses look like. So really, we're just looking for correlations. We want to know if you have a higher immune response, do you tend to have a lower risk of infection? Okay, and then sort of a higher standard, I would say, of establishing a correlate is the so-called correlates of protection. And there, we're really interested in evaluating the ability of immune response to predict efficacy of a vaccine, right? And so already, efficacy is, is used there, right? Efficacy, effect. It's implying that there's something causal about this approach. And so often, the approaches we use to evaluate correlates of protection are going to rely on methodologies from coming out of the causal inference literature. And so just to give you a flavor of the sorts of analyses we're planning to do with these data, uh, correlates of risk, again, that's, that's looking for, for correlates, things that correlate, immune responses that correlate with risk of disease. And so you can think of that as sort of like standard statistical approaches, maybe fitting a Cox model of the time to COVID disease against, you know, a set of immune responses. And here is just a, a sort of uh, illustration of what that might look like, right? So on the y-axis, we have probability of COVID uh, disease. Maybe that's a cumulative probability over some fixed time window. And we're plotting that risk as a function of maybe a neutralizing antibody titer. And here we would say this is evidence that this is a correlative risk, right? We see that the higher the level of your antibodies, the more antibodies you generate in response to the vaccine, the lower your risk of disease. Uh, we're also interested in sort of integrating, you know, more high dimensional panels of immune responses potentially to do risk prediction, relying on some machine learning methodologies. And so here's a, a figure sort of illustrating what that might look like. So there we're really developing machine learning models based on multiple sets of antibody markers, cellular immunity markers, uh, and trying to understand, do these sets of antibody markers allow you to predict disease better than expected by chance? On the other hand, correlates of protection, again, that's moving a bit beyond these associative parameters into a causal realm. Okay, and so the types of questions we ask there are things like effect modifiers of VE, where effect modification is being defined by levels of the immune response uh, in response to, to vaccination. And so that kind of sounds benign on the surface, right? We all know how to do effect modification and maybe a standard regression framework. We include interaction terms. But remember, it's, it's actually a little bit trickier here, right? Because the effect modifier that we're talking about is actually occurring after vaccination. It's not like a baseline characteristic, it's a post-randomization characteristic. And that kind of considerably complicates the story when we want to talk about effect modification. Uh, so Michael Jaraska has done a ton of great work in that area, and a paper of his is linked here. Uh, of course, it's very natural to think of mediation type parameters in this setting, right? We want to understand the vaccine has an impact on this immune response, and that immune response has an impact on eventual clinical disease. So understanding these pathways uh, whereby these immune or whereby these vaccines work through immune responses. Uh, is kind of another goal of correlates of protection analyses, right? And we can answer questions like what percentage of the efficacy of the vaccine is attributable to the immune responses that we measured, right? Have we captured the right immune responses or are there likely some other mechanisms out there that might explain efficacy? And then more recently, we've been working on alternative parameters, more like controlled, controlled effects parameters 
that we're calling stochastic interventional VE. And there we're really saying, what would happen? What would your risk look like if I took this immune response distribution that I observed in response to this current vaccine and I started shifting it around, right? What would happen if I gave you just a little bit more of this, um, of this particular immune response? How would that impact risk? So I have a great student who has a paper out recently at that that's, that's linked there. Okay, so we're going to come back a long time ago, I said, to think about uh, this, this immune response draw. Natalie, I see you there. Should I be wrapping up? Okay, so I'll just mention that the way that we study these correlates is through what's known as case cohort sampling. And so at the beginning, I said that we're drawing these, these markers, or sorry, we're drawing blood on all trial participants, uh, but we're not going to measure these immune response markers on everybody, right? Instead, we're going to use this case cohort design where we grab a random sub cohort of the whole study cohort to measure immune responses. And then we augment that with, with additional cases, of infection and disease endpoints. And this presents some statistical challenges that I described here. You basically are inducing a bias sample design. So you have to do something about that. Uh, and moreover, we're facing some challenges in, in, this, in this regard because these vaccines are so effective. And ultimately that's good news, right? That we have highly effective vaccines, uh, but it has left us in a bit of a tricky place in terms of understanding what we're gonna be able to do for these correlates analyses. And then I'll just finally mention, and then I'll wrap up, uh, that there's a real effort in the, Cov v uh, the Covpian statistician group to be doing open science uh, and, and to be very open about the approaches that we're gonna take. We have a version controlled SAP for the uh, correlates analysis that's available for review. We'll be developing open source software uh, that we'll be distributing amongst the OWS companies and beyond to be able to reproduce these uh, results um, and analyses in a, in a fully reproducible way. And we're hoping to get started on this work as soon as the, the data from these trials clears regulators and starts coming in early next year. So I'll, I'll put my concluding thoughts up there, but I'll stop talking now and I'm looking forward to a great discussion. And thanks again, Natalie and, and Betts for joining. Wonderful, thanks so much, David, excellent. Um, okay, so uh, now we have uh, Betts Halloran. She's gonna offer a few um, remarks. <clears throat> Thank you, Natalie, and that was a great talk, David. Um, and I'll keep my remarks brief because um, we want more questions. I have five little points I want to make. And the first two are related to the talk. Um, and David mentioned about this advising, the, the company, the CoVPN statisticians are advising the vaccine companies and um, trying to harmonize the protocols, but they actually aren't the statisticians. and so. These trials are all run, run by the companies themselves, even though they're part of OWS and have some. So it's a huge amount of mental energy and brain trust of our colleagues, the statisticians who are going in to try to uh, harmonize trials, as he had said. And, and the correlates of risk and protection is very exciting. And I'm not part of the CoVPN, even though a lot of these people are my colleagues here, um, because to be able to perform this across vaccine platforms. And this just is a tremendous opportunity. And as you said, they're planning this all in very open science for it. And it, it's really an incredible end of our colleagues. And that I would like to say to our colleagues on this call that should be some press on that. that um, I think it would be great. People write about team trials, but it would be find a way to get the story of all that the statisticians are doing and behind the scenes, make this run smoothly. And, um, if any has an idea on that, please uh, let me know. So the third point is a uh, trial platform that has not launched. It's the WHO Solidarity Trial Platform. And Natalie and I are both, we're both involved with the protocol for that. And that would be a core protocol coordinated WHO for different vaccines involved with, it would be a core protocol so that several vaccines could be in the same trial and they would share a placebo group. Now, I know that has not yet launched and I'm not sure that everything's speeding, if it's gonna have a chance to launch now that these vaccines are already showing some really positive results in trials, but it is a, um, it's a much different, um, of in the trials. Um, the fourth point I want to make is uh, related to the randomization and blinding. And most of the people on this call would understand the importance of relation and blinding in trials. 
ethical considerations that are going to come up coming up if you get the emergency um, use of a EUA for a vaccine, is it still ethical to continue the follow up of the and to go to the continue the phase three trial? And the FDA, when I listen to it, they think that you should continue the blinded trial because EUA is not licensure, but it's going to raise a lot of issues. And and David mentioned the two years of follow-up for safety, but if it's a license, be licensed well before that two years. And then so the placebo uh, recipients could receive the vaccine. And so that would damage the um, blinded uh, follow-up. And so there's a, there's a issue, that's just one. There was a show call about this a few weeks ago. And the fifth point, because I do population effects of vaccines, is that there's a lot of challenges in understanding what is the effect of the vaccine on transmission. If you're vaccinated and you get needed, are you less transmissible to another person? And I have challenges of that for the uh, sake of time. It's an only you would, so the idea is if I get vaccinated and I get infected, I might infect fewer people. That has important policy considerations. And there are people trying to design the trials related to that. And we can discuss that in the, in the chat or in the questions. But it would be very uh, important to understand that. And these individually randomized trials are not set up to any of population level effects. Vaccines. So with that, I'll stop so we have some questions from the chat and Q&A. Great, thanks so much. So David, will you rejoin us? Okay, great. Yeah, so um, so that actually leads us into, uh, so so we'll open this up for, for questions. I see a number of excellent questions uh, have, have come in through the chat. Unfortunately, we're probably not gonna be able to address them all, but um, I'll pick out a few uh, interesting ones. I mean, I think would, nicely this leads into a lot of questions about how we're measuring the vaccine effect on infection. So maybe it would be helpful to explain a little bit um, how these trials are measuring that outcome and uh, and yeah, what implications, what questions may remain unanswered and what other types of studies may we need to, to address, you know, how the vaccine will impact on um, herd immunity and transmission at the population level. And so either either person take it away. Yeah, I can jump in and just remind of the data that will be generated from the trials. And that's really the serology data that we get at these scheduled clinic visits. And I think for Moderna, if I'm recalling off the top of my head, there's their first serologies at six months. And for most of their trial participants, that means early 2021. And so I expect we'll have blinded data on infections, uh, asymptomatic infections at that time point. Um, and so you, I think you'll start to see results coming out at that time. Um, and AstraZeneca in their UK and Brazil trial actually did a lot more active follow-up. If, if I'm remembering right, they were doing weekly swabs of participants. And so they've also generated some interesting data, I think, uh, as well. Uh, there, I think there will need to be caveats with those data because, as I said, there's sort of some statistical challenges in evaluating this, this efficacy against this endpoint. And I think that's true of infections in general. So, so I think there may be sticker shock, right? If we come out and we say that, that the VE against asymptomatic infections is, is low, uh, and that could be explained either because it's a real result or potentially due to just bias due to the sampling design. And so I'd be, I, I'll kick it over to Betts then to understand a little bit more about this infectiousness question, because that's one that I'm not sure that we're gonna be generating data in these phase threes to get an adequate answer for, but I'd love for Betts to prove me wrong about that. Well, I've been, I'm, I'm part of the COVPN, but um, interact with a lot of the colleagues and um, Holly Janes and Elizabeth Brown are tasked with trying to figure this out. And so we've had a few discussions uh, COVPN um, immediately. And a couple of the issues, I mean, one is it's very hard. Normally in my world, you'd want to have people like transmission units, like households, and you'd have maybe a case in a household that's vaccinated and a case in a different household who's not vaccinated. And you'd look at how many of the household people, portion of the people get infected, but it's not that easy. One, you mentioned the asymptomatic infections. 
um, they are considering a design in college students. Um, and then the question also the ethical, and then you might do contact tracing and find out how many of the contacts of the people who got infected if they're vaccinated on. So the idea is a randomized placebo controlled trial in college students. And then, but then you have all sorts of other statistical issues, like you say, so the people who get infected, um, and then you look at whether they transmit, they're no longer a random sample, they're no longer randomized once they get infected into so post infection selection bias issues. Um, the other ethical question is, okay, so suppose we get an EAU and suppose this, is it ethical to randomize college students, say in January or February, because maybe they're not on the list of people to get the vaccine yet. So are, are there issues like that? that? So what they're thinking about, a lot of the discussion um, that they're having, and I hope I'm not misrepresenting them if they're on the call, is to look at um, viral shedding as a surrogate for reducing transmission, which has its own issues because what, how do you measure the viral load and is it a point or is it a under the um, area under the curve kind of, there's a lot of issues. So um, I, in principle, it's easy to think about how to measure reduction in infectiousness, but in the practicalities um, currently seem still a little overwhelming. Great. And so this has come up a little bit um, and I've seen it in the chat too. And how do we ensure that there is a pathway for these other vaccines that may not be as far along in development? We want multiple vaccines. Um, what might the next few months, you know, look like for some of these other vaccine candidates that are being studied? I'll just say a few words and then David can chime in. I heard Tom Fleming speak on this again. I'm participating in a lot of meetings. It may have to revert. if, if any vaccines actually get licensed, it may have to turn on inferiority trials where you have back-to-back, -back. you have back trials, and those become much larger and they can be much longer. And that has advantages in that you can look at a trial that is longer and, and you can see the long-term effects on the immunity, uh, waning, you can look for waning and durability of the vaccine. Um, uh, Tom has probably up on the web some of his excellent technical uh, descriptions of this. Um, the other one would pathway circuits, if, which is a challenge. I, I'm not sure that David said this. These vaccines that are coming, giving us results, they're highly efficacious. And you need a lot of breakthrough cases to establish the correlates of protection. And they aren't gonna have those probably. So there's gonna be a challenge there, but that would be a second pathway to license uh, new vaccines based on the correlates. David, my I, no, I, I agree completely. Yeah, so maybe we can, I, I think Beth did a good job taking that one. Great, great. Um, so uh, another question is about children, uh, pregnant women, populations that have been excluded or, or so far have not um, been a part of these large efficacy trials. Um, you know, what's that going to look like in terms of generating the data, the timelines um, for, for a, a, you know, when might we have a, a vaccine for, for kids, for example? Can I jump in on that? Because I actually had a chat with Peter Gilbert yesterday about this, and he's not involved. But apparently, I mean, one of the issues for children, and I, I can't speak for children, and, and David mentioned the children, the bridging through these surrogates, uh, the correlates. Uh, but one of the issues for children is safety. And so they will have to run safety trials. And a couple of the groups, the networks that have already existed, are working on this, um, not the COVPN itself, but some of the other networks are trying to put this. So they need to do safety in children. And, and, and if they don't have surrogates, in my mind, this is my opinion, they may just, if they can show it's safe in children and it's highly efficacious in adults, they might just, FDA might at least give an EUA to, um, to, to vaccinate children even as long as it's safe. So that I, that's the pathway I think for children right now. I agree. Okay, <laughs> great, great. Um, so there's some questions about uh, vaccine safety. Um, and so, you know, one question might have is about um, our ability to assess both short-term and longer-term safety. Um, any discussion about, uh, you know, um, yeah, what, what uh, considerations for assessing uh, safety? 
Yeah, I mean, that's that's the question I've been asked a lot, sort of particularly in reference to the mRNA vaccines, being that Pfizer and Moderna, you know, will be in all likelihood the first licensed mRNA vaccines. And there's a dearth of long-term safety data for mRNA vaccines. And that's a concern I hear expressed a lot. And, you know, on, on one hand, I can I can see the legitimacy of, of it, of course, right? We haven't generated those data yet. But, but what I can offer is that the systems are in place to generate those data as we go forward through through the trial participants and long term follow up and through vaccine surveillance networks. And so, you know, vaccines among all medical products, I think, have the best surveillance systems in place for for safety endpoints going forward. And so, yeah, we don't have the data yet, but but we will learn about it soon. And, you know, ideally, we'll have other products brought to market as well, such that people who are uh, concerned about mRNA vaccines can potentially get a subunit vaccine or or a different you know, more well studied, more well tried and true uh, platform of a vaccine that's also equally effective. That's the hope. Great. Um, so it's useful for people, you know, to remember there's a distinction between vaccine efficacy and vaccine effectiveness. Some of these vaccines are, you know, two dose vaccines in the real world. People might not receive all of the doses. Um, do we have any? Are these trials going to generate any data about, um, you know, how well a one dose, you know, one dose of a two dose regimen works, or you know, what what are some of the considerations in when translating these trial results to the real world? Yeah, I, I think probably from the phase three trials, we won't have a good sense of one dose vaccines. Of course. Um, Janssen's vaccine, right, is one dose, right? So there are one dose vaccines being evaluated, but in terms of sort of what if we go down to one dose of a two dose regimen, I'm not sure we'll know that. We could try to get there with uh, a correlate potentially and, and try to do bridging, um, but I'm not confident that we'll be able to do that. So so I think the best hope for one dose is, is hitting on Janssen. Um, and, and then potentially, you know, if, if AstraZeneca is able to explore further this result of, of better efficacy with a half initial dose of their vaccine, then of course that has implications for global supply as well. Great. Uh, well, I mean, maybe it's worth talking about some of these. Uh, so, uh, so David in his uh, presentation offered a little bit of results from um, uh, Russia. And then we have, and then also there are the um, uh, vaccines um, that are being developed in China, and, and actually over a million people in China have already been been vaccinated. Um, do, does anyone want to comment on, uh, on? No, not really. <laughs> the the different pathways uh, that, that we've, uh, yeah. The, what are the you know? I, I don't know anything about the Chinese. Okay. Russian. All right. No problem. No problem. Um, okay, so we just have a few few minutes remaining. I mean, I really, um, how do we think that this will impact vaccine development for future vaccines for other diseases? And will it change really how we approach vaccine development in general? I mean, are some of these lessons very specific to COVID, to a pandemic, to, or, or are there things that may alter how we develop vaccines for um, other types of diseases as well? Well, I'm not sure. Uh, we seem to have been lucky. And I will have to say, I was one of the ones at the beginning, I said those mRNA vaccines are never going to work. Um, but we seem to be lucky with this virus. Now, as, and maybe that means that there's good immunity. We don't know the long-term immune. Things like malaria or all these people here at Fred Hutch have been working for decades trying to get an HIV vaccine out. Um, you know, this isn't going to speed that up. So there are diseases and infections where it's easier to develop a vaccine and there's ones where it's harder. And you were involved with the Ebola. The Ebola vaccine worked also, works very well. We were lucky with that, that it was one that um, we develop a good immune response and the vaccine was not too complicated. So I don't know if there's general things. Uh, David might have an idea, but this one so far, so far we're lucky. We don't know what it's going to look like five years from now, but we're lucky right now. Yeah, well, I mean, I think in some ways, both Ebola and and this pandemic have been sort of trial by fire in how to do science in the context of of it in an outbreak setting. Of course, Natalie, that's something you know a lot about, and. I think there will be a lot of lessons learned in terms of how we could be doing things better and getting things off the ground and, 
in a smoother fashion. But I, I do think we are, you know, getting a lot better in that in those responses. I mean, the fact that we were able to bring a vaccine for Ebola and for and for this disease so quickly is, is saying we're on the right path. But I do think we can we can still look to do better in future outbreaks. We'll count on Natalie to tell us how. <laughs> Um, so, uh, I mean, a sort of a related question, this is something that we've been thinking about is um, when you have these separate trials, maybe in separate locations, so AstraZeneca comes to mind or the Oxford vaccine is, is having these multiple separate trials in different countries. And now we're seeing that, um, you know, the, the result that they presented was the UK and Brazil. And do you have any thoughts about this pooling of studies and, you know, when that makes sense and any considerations um, there? That's a, it's, a, it's a good question. I mean, so I guess I would highlight that a lot of the, you know, nominal U.S. phase threes also have international sites as well. And so I think to a large extent, the extent to which it's appropriate within a given trial to collect data across, you know, very diverse ge geographical regions, is the extent to which you're able to harmonize protocols across those regions. And I think that the open question for me, just because I don't know, I haven't seen the details, is sort of what that looked like for AstraZeneca in the UK versus Brazil. Because it seemed like there were sort of two parallel trials launched and then they sort of merged. Um, whereas here, sort of everything's being developed under a single protocol potentially, which, which I think makes it a little bit easier. And I'd like to so emphasize also that some of these trials are international, even though some of the Operation Warp Speed, like David said, some of these trials are international trials. And so they are running under the same protocol. And I make a plug for Nicole Basta's website where she, you can go up and see all the trials on all the, you know, what they're registered under and which countries they're running in. And I don't have the link right here, but um, it's, a, it's a very user-friendly website. You can see exactly which countries, each one of the um, ones that are registered at clinicaltrials.gov, which ones actually are running in which country. So some of these companies have three different trials running, but those trials themselves are international. So it's a, it's a good question that you ask. One thing, if you look at the map up at that site, you'll notice that there are very few trials running in Africa. And that raises a real issue because some vaccines work differently in the African, in, in undernourished populations. And so we, we really don't know. There's only very few countries in Africa. There's this big hole all over Africa where there are no trials running yet. So um, that raises another issue of, of will the vaccines work in those populations? Great. Well, I think that's a nice place to stop. I mean, it really demonstrates, I think, uh, an important lesson, which is of harmonization. I think that's been a real strength of what you know, Operation Warp Speed and solidarity and you know what uh, the, the value of really coming together in advance to plan out. I mean, statisticians, we know the importance of being part of those discussions early on. So, um, so thank you so much to Betts. David, um, Chi Hong, and uh, you know, Jim and Glenn, and everyone else who helped coordinate these. Um, sorry if I didn't get to all the questions, uh, but I hope people will rejoin um, for our next session. Thanks, everyone.